Hey guys, welcome into week three of our series, Stories. We're halfway through. Uh, tonight, we're looking again at a story of an ordinary person sharing God's story with someone else, sharing the gospel, doing evangelism. Tonight, we're going to look at the story of Peter when he goes to visit a Roman centurion named Cornelius. So we'll look at that in just a minute. As usual, we want to begin like we do every week with some time set aside for prayer and for worship. So uh, I want you to, again, just like you did last week, go ahead and pause at some point and spend some time in prayer. Remember to be praying for your one person, whoever that is. If you've forgotten who your person is or you've decided to move on from that person, that's cool, but you need to think of someone else, uh, like tonight, and go ahead and begin praying for that person. Pray that they will hear the gospel, respond to the gospel. If they need a church home, that they will find and join the church home. But we're focusing in, praying for that one person. So make sure you're spending time in prayer for that person and also not just praying for them, but reaching out to them, making contact, talking with them, uh, however you choose to do that, social media, texting, phone call, uh, however you do, but make sure that you're also building a relationship, making contact, right? Can't just pray and hope that they'll hear the gospel and respond to it, but then never put the gospel in front of them. So pray for that one person, uh, for your own personal uh, prayer requests, whatever's going on in your life. Remember to reach out to me with those as well if you want to. Uh, be in prayer for the things taking place in the life of our church, um, for all the things happening around our country. And then when you're done with your time of prayer, whether it's alone or with family or whoever you're with, remember to spend a little time in worship. Uh, use your own song that you're really uh, listening to right now. If you can't think of anything that you're really into, check out our YouTube playlist. But spend some time in worship and in prayer, and then come back here and we will pick up with our Bible study. So if you have your Bible or you're using a phone or however you want to do it tonight, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. If you don't have those things available, the verses will be here on the screen. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, and we are going to read quite a few verses. So stay with me. We're going to read through the whole thing, and then we'll come back and we'll break it down uh, into what we want to pay attention to. So tonight the story is about Peter and a man named Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion. Um, and this is in the book of Acts, so this is after Jesus has left the earth, he sent the Spirit, Pentecost has taken place, the church has formed and is going out and sharing the good news, telling God's story to others, it's growing. And Peter has this really unique experience take place one day. Now remember, Peter's just an ordinary guy. Now he's one of the disciples, he's one of the, the founders of the early church, if you want to look at it that way. But Peter's just an ordinary guy, all right? So keep that in mind through this whole series that these are ordinary people telling God's story. So let's take a look at our verses beginning in Acts chapter 10, verse 9. It says, The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. He became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, said Peter, for I have never eaten anything um, impure and ritually unclean. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, What God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times, and suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. While Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, right away the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. Then Peter went to the men and said, Here I am, the one you're looking for. What is the reason you're here? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, 
was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in <clears throat> and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and set out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up. I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, Four days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then, a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon, Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good of you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all of Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen not by all the people, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So what we want to see tonight from this passage really is only one key thing and then one review of an older thing. So the key thing that we want to see tonight from this passage is that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. And when we look at this story, when we talk about the fact that the gospel is for everyone, you know and I know those people that come to mind Sometimes we think about sharing the gospel with that person. We think about telling God's story to that person, or maybe not even to someone that we personally know, but to someone who fits into a, a certain group of people. And we think to ourselves, there's no need in sharing the gospel with them. We don't think they'll respond positively. We think that they are just too far gone for the gospel to have any impact on them. And we write people off for one reason or another. I've done it. You've probably done it. Most of the people in the church have done it. It's wrong for us to do, but it's also easy for us to do. We write people off because we think the gospel can't reach them. They're too far out in left field. Or uh, I just already know they won't answer. They won't respond. It's not worth wasting my time. I already know what the answer is going to be. And we write these people off. But what we see in this story is that the gospel is for everyone. If we want to look at Peter and Cornelius, Peter had a couple of pretty significant reasons to think, well, there's no point 
in going to see this guy. There's no point in me, in me traveling all that way and sharing the gospel. If you want to talk about those reasons, here are a couple of really big ones. First, he was a Roman centurion. Now, centurion, those of you who don't know, is a commander who was in charge of about 100 troops in the Roman army. So he was not just a Roman soldier, but he was a, a commanding Roman officer. And the Roman Empire had already and would continue to make life pretty difficult for some believers and for the early church. And so that is a reason that Peter could have said, I'm not going to visit that guy. He's a Roman centurion. I'm not walking into his house and declaring myself a believer. I'm not going in there and sharing the gospel. Maybe he would do something to me personally. Maybe I'm going to get arrested. Or maybe Peter could have just refused to go because he is Roman and he's a soldier in the Roman army and they've made life difficult for my people and for, for believers, for Christians. So I'm not going to go. I already know what his answer will be. He's working for the enemy. He's part of this group of people that we are opposed to or that are opposed to us. And we can take all of those same prejudices that Peter could have had and we can bring them over to us today. And we can do the same thing. I already know that person's answer will be, that person belongs to this group that I'm opposed to, this group that I think is opposed to Christ, whether it's a certain a political group or a certain activity they take part in or, or sometimes even a certain race, the way they look. I'm opposed to that group, and so no, I'm not, I'm not even going to bother sharing the gospel with them. They hang out with those people at school. They're that group that sits over there in the cafeteria. I'm not even going to bother. But Peter, we see, got up and he went. Peter also could have refused to go because Cornelius was a Gentile. And Peter even said that to this point, it was forbidden by, by Jewish law for Jews to really associate with Gentiles much at all. There was a group, even in, in the early church, who believed that Christianity was only for Jews who wanted to follow Christ and convert and become Christians, but that Gentiles did not have the opportunity to become Christians because they were not Jews. And so some, even in the early church, would have said, Peter, there's no point in you going to visit Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He cannot be a Christian. He cannot become a believer. Gentiles are unclean. We're not supposed to associate with them. And so Peter had a couple of reasons that he could have said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going. He could have refused to go out of fear because this guy is a Roman soldier. He could have refused to go out of a sense of superiority. Uh, I'm a Jew. He's a Gentile. We can't, we can't spend time with one another. He's not one of God's chosen people. He can't become a Christian. He could have chosen uh, to stay away just because of prejudice. So Peter had all of these reasons that he could have chosen not to go, but he went because Peter recognized that the gospel is for everyone. Now, Peter had to be taught this. If you remember at the beginning of our passage, Peter had to learn this lesson as well. And that vision that he had of the sheet coming down with all the animals in it and the voice told him, get up and kill and eat. And Peter said, no, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. There were certain animals or certain kinds of animals that the Jews were not allowed to eat like pigs and pork because they were, they were ritually unclean. And so Peter looks into the sheet and says, that's full of unclean animals. I'm not going to eat those things. And the voice that came from heaven, the voice of God said, don't call anything that God has made unclean. And that's that moment when we realize, oh, he's not really talking about animals. He's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about non-Jews. Because the initial reaction from a lot of those early believers when, when Cornelius invited them to come would have been, no, you're a Gentile. I'm a Jew. We don't associate because you're unclean. But this voice says, don't call anything that God has created unclean, including Cornelius, including the Gentiles, including that kid at school that you don't really want to be around 
including that group of people that you disagree with so strongly that you think the gospel obviously isn't for them, including that person that is, is so far out there in their behavior and their actions that you look and think there's no way that they would ever respond to the gospel. Don't call anything God has created unclean. The gospel is for everyone, and our responsibility is to give it to everyone that we can. Now, maybe that person doesn't respond positively to the gospel. Maybe not. Maybe that group doesn't respond positively. But that's not your responsibility. It's not your responsibility to somehow argue, persuade, and convince them into becoming Christians. That's the job of the Spirit. You see in our text that Peter spoke, but it says that the Spirit moved in the lives of those people, those Romans who were listening. So maybe you do go and step out and you share the gospel with that person that you go to school with, that person that you work with, that you think, man, there's just no way. Maybe they don't respond, but that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to tell God's story. Maybe they do respond. Stranger things have happened. More difficult people and, and, and worse people than that person that you go to school with or that person you work with have responded to the gospel and had their lives completely turned around. But again, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility and my responsibility, Peter's responsibility, was to tell God's story, regardless of what takes place afterwards. That's the work of the Spirit. So I want us to understand tonight, and next week we're going to look at a story that wraps all of this up that we've been learning, put us all in, you can see it all in one story. But tonight we need to understand the new key thing, that the gospel is for everyone. If you have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone that you think there's no way they're going to respond, do it regardless. If you have an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody who belongs to a group or, or a, a social circle that you disagree with, you think, I don't want to be part of that, but you have an opportunity to share the gospel with one or more of that group, do it. Maybe they respond. Maybe they don't. But they've heard the gospel. And you have carried out the command that was given to you by your king. The gospel is for everyone. The work that comes after is the work of the Spirit. The other thing that we quickly want to want to call back to from a couple of weeks ago is we see in this story as well that telling God's story is simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you go back and you look at the story that Peter told when he preaches the gospel to Cornelius and his household and his friends, it's about seven sentences long. That's it. Seven sentences. One good paragraph. I know most of y'all think that a good paragraph is like four sentences, but it's usually more like seven. One good paragraph, and then the Spirit works, and this whole household is saved. They become believers. Sharing the gospel doesn't have to be complicated. And it doesn't have to be complicated because, like we were just saying, it's not my responsibility to persuade somebody to become a Christian. It's my responsibility to put the facts of the gospel before them and then let the Spirit do what the Spirit's going to do. I'm not a used car salesman. I'm not a gospel salesman. I'm not trying to persuade you. And, and listen, if you become a Christian now, you can get 50% cash back on your next trip to wherever you go. I'm not a salesman. I'm just telling the story. I just tell God's story. The Spirit does the work. So it doesn't have to be complicated. Peter very simply explained, this is who Jesus was. He was born and he did these things and they crucified him and God raised him back to life. He is the Son of God. And if you trust in him, then you can have eternal life. That's simple as that. And they converted. So the gospel, first of all, is for everyone. Second, it does not have to be complicated. Now again, next week we're going to look at a story that wraps those things up in, in one story. We'll see everything we've learned so far in one story. But tonight, I really want you to wrestle with and think about the idea that the gospel is for everybody, not just the people that you like. Think of that person that comes to mind when you think of Someone that, that would never answer, would never respond. 
that person that you think it's not even worth your time trying to tell them about the gospel, think of that person or that group of people, and I want you to spend some time in prayer over the next few days and ask God to start breaking down that idea that you have that it's not worth sharing the gospel with them. Ask God to start breaking that down. And then I want you to put some feet to your prayers. I want you to actually do something with it and look for opportunity, like we talked about last week, look for opportunity to actually begin to share the gospel with that person. You may or may not have to build a relationship, but look for opportunities to share the gospel with someone that maybe you think there's no way they'll respond. Maybe they won't, maybe they will. So think of that person or that group Pray for God to begin to change your attitude and look for opportunities to begin to share the gospel with that person or with that group. So you've just seen your questions. I hope you respond to those and send those answers to me. Let's continue uh, to stay engaged. Next week, again, we're going to look at a story from the life of Paul. Who else? And we're going to see all of the things that we've learned in these previous three weeks in one story. We're going to see the fact that the gospel, that telling God's story is simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. We're going to see the fact that it's all about seizing opportunity and being obedient. And we're going to see the fact that the gospel is for everybody, even those people that we don't like or we don't think will answer. So we'll look at that next week. I encourage you to continue in your own Bible study, your own prayer, your own worship throughout the week. And we'll see that again. We'll wrap this series up next week. Looking forward to seeing you guys soon.